How do you mitigate these risks? How do you become aware of what could happen in your practice with your patient populations? And what can, what improvements or what um, habits, as I mentioned, can you fold into your daily practice that will, you know, decrease the likelihood of a claim, but increase patient safety? What is a nurse practitioner's professional liability exposure at this point in history? And what do NPs need to understand about this crucial topic? Let's talk all about it with Jennifer Lynn, Vice President of Risk Management for Nurses Service Organization, right here on episode 405 of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello there. This is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you and your personal professional development, your nursing career, and the healthcare system in the bigger picture. And I'm always here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people around in the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, and beyond. And I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And guess what? You can now get CEUs from listening to podcasts. That's right. Over at rnegade.pro, that's R-N-E-G-A-D-E.pro, we're building a library of nursing podcasts offering continuing education credits, and a CE will be available for listening to this episode in a little while. So all you have to do is head over to rnegade.pro, log into the portal, Select me, Nurse Keith, from the content creator dropdown, and you can get CEs for any of my content that's up on the platform. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, you can leave a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Google or Amazon or Spotify, or just share the show with other people. So please head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for this episode, or you can actually find the show notes in any app where you happen to be listening. So Jennifer, it's really great to have you here. I'm so glad that we connected and you reached out. And just as a disclosure, I'll just say that I've been a customer, a client of Nurses Service Organization since I became a nurse. So oh, wow. I've had, yeah, I've had liability insurance with you all for a very, very long time. So I just wanted to say that out loud right at the start. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. I um I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your podcast today and, and thanks for having me. And, and I did not know that, that you were yeah. a customer of NSO, but great to hear. Yeah. Long time, long time great. customer, first time caller. No, just <laughs> okay. So just recently, and you can enlighten us a little bit more about the process, but just recently your nurse practitioner professional liability exposure claim report, the fifth edition came out. And the yes. subtitle of that is called Minimizing Risk in Achieving Excellence. And it was created by NSO, Nurses Service Organization, and CNA. Yes. So tell us briefly, who is NSO? What are they all about? And what or who are CNA? Sure. Um, so NSO, Nurses Service Organization, and our underwriting partner, CNA, we are providers of professional liability insurance to nurses across the country. Um, we have been insuring nurses for over 30 years in, a, in our partnership. And um, we look to inform and make aware uh, to our providers that we ensure the risks that they might face in their daily practice and CNA um, supports allowing us to look into those claim files and to discuss and, and um, publish the findings of our analysis so that nurse practitioners and registered nurses alike can um, be aware and, and educate themselves and make improvements to their risk control habits in their daily practice. Mm -hmm. So risk control habits. That's a really interesting term that I've never heard before. Uh, we've all heard the terms, you know, risk management, but risk control habits. So we'll get to that. Like what, 
we'll get to what to do in order to protect oneself and protect one's license. Sure. So we'll talk about that. But I was interested in some of the top key findings of this professional liability exposure claim report. And it says here, on, I'm on um, one of the first, I'm on page three of the this 28-page report, that the average total incurred of professional liability claims in the 2022 data set, $332,137, increased more than 10.5% since 2017, which was $300,500. So yes. what does that really mean? Yeah, so... Um, that total incurred amount is the amount that um, it costs to manage, defend, and resolve a claim against a nurse practitioner. So by way of that, we mean um, when, when a nurse practitioner insured in the program uh, reports an incident to us that turns into um, something needing a legal defense, we um, not only have attorneys who represent our nurses, so it's the cost of the attorneys, the court costs, but it's also the cost of any expert witnesses we might hire on behalf of the nurse practitioner to defend those cases, as well as if a case turns out to have been proven that the nurse practitioner was negligent in some way, that amount includes the amount paid to the injured third party to resolve the claim. I see. So that cost has gone up around thirty-one to thirty-two thousand dollars since 2017. So that's over five years. Yes. But from your perspective, what you know about risk management, you've been in this business for a while. Do you consider that normal? Do you consider that shocking? What does that tell you? Well, I'm always shocked to see some of the amounts that are awarded to um, injured third parties in any liability lawsuit these days. And and to that point, those amounts are going up. Mm -hmm. But a few reasons that might be driving that for nurse practitioners specifically is, you know, nurse practitioners are being asked to work to the fullest extent of their scope of practice. In many states, they are allowed to practice independently or autonomously. And so they are bearing the lion's share of that claim should um, negligence be proven, as well as, you know, their amounts are getting closer and closer to, if not equal at this point, to that of a physician because of all of the things they do in their daily practice, um, diagnosing, prescribing, medications, working with complex patients, all of those reasons are contributing to that, that high amount. And I will say this, that um, compared to a registered nurse, that amount is, is higher because of those um, those things nurse practitioners are allowed allowed to do. Our registered nurses total incurred or average total incurred amount is hovering right around $210,000 on average per claim to manage, defend, and resolve that claim. So about $100,000 less for a registered nurse. Yes. Mm -hmm. good, good thing for RNs to know, even though we're talking about this nurse practitioner report you just put out. It's good for us. We'll throw in a few things about RNs in relation to nurse practitioners, just for comparison's sake, because a lot of NPs or majority were RNs at one time, and a lot of RNs are considering becoming NPs. And I just want to say, which I've said on this show before, is that right now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is projecting 40-ish percent job growth for nurse practitioners through 2031. And for RNs, the projected job growth is like around six or seven percent, where whereas it used to be around 14 or 15 percent. And physicians is down around three percent. So nurse practitioners are the fastest growing professional career track in the United States right now. 
So there's a lot of attention being paid to them. And there's a lot of celebration going on and recognition that NPs, like you said, are gaining autonomy and independence of practice in more and more states. And there are hopes that that will eventually encompass all 50 states plus territories. I'm I'm wondering from your perspective, is that sort of a double-edged sword? Because yes, you have more independence and autonomy. However, you're also going to bear a whole lot more responsibility. Absolutely. I mean, if you think of the role that nurse practitioners play in treatment and care of patients and how that is, as you mentioned, expanding across the country and they're having explosive growth in terms of um, availability of jobs across the country. They truly work in all different practice settings, whether that be um, a physician office, a senior living community, their own healthcare practice where they are the owner and most likely the primary provider in that practice. So we're seeing um, nurse practitioners working in all practice settings. And, and so the claims are, are there as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, we try and through the report show through our data, you know, not only the number of claims that we're seeing and the amount it's costing to defend and manage those claims, but where those claims are occurring, what location, to which specialty, what was the patient injury that led to that claim, um, and what that top allegation was that we saw when the patient initiated the liability claim. Mm -hmm. It's really meant to say to nurse practitioners, if I'm working in this practice setting and there's you know, a high risk of claims because of the patient population that is there, whether that be geriatrics or pediatrics, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of emotion around the claim when we're talking about um, patient populations that if, uh, if an injury occurs to a baby Mm -hmm. or one of our loved ones that are, that are in a senior community, even those in behavioral health that might be seen as a, a an at-risk group, mm-hmm. the emotion behind that injury also sort of prompts them to seek an, an attorney's advice and to decide whether or not to initiate that liability lawsuit. Well, that makes sense, right? The emotional aspect of it with an elder or let's say a neonate, that's enormous. Absolutely. Yes. Um, You know, we have many different claim examples that we highlight in the report, not just the metrics and the data behind the the claims, but also bringing that claim to life by giving a few details around what was happening at the time of the incident that led to that malpractice lawsuit or even the State Board of Nursing complaint. Mm -hmm. Um, Just to give you a brief example, if we're talking about a pediatric nurse practitioner who is treating a patient. Um, We had one example where the patient was not hitting key milestones, showing delayed growth with uh, related to social and education and development, further diving into the history of that patient, that they lived in an older home and that it was required, a requirement in their state that if they met this certain criteria, that there would be lead screening or testing for that patient. And when you talk about a pediatric nurse practitioner not screening for lead, and then it turning out that that is the cause of the injury, those cases become difficult to defend. For that mm-hmm. nurse practitioner being a pediatric nurse practitioner and not knowing the requirements in their state, we're not seeing in the record that the screening didn't occur at that 12-month visit, at that 18-month visit. It, they, those cases sort of weigh on the, the jurors as well, what could have been done differently to protect this patient and to not have this this outcome? And then on the flip side, we try and impart recommendations to nurse practitioners to say, 
How do you mitigate these risks? How do you become aware of what could happen in your practice with your patient populations? And what can, what improvements or what um, habits, as I mentioned, can you fold into your daily practice that will, you know, decrease the likelihood of a claim, but increase patient safety? Hmm. Well, in the second half, we're definitely going to talk about solutions. We're going to talk about, you know, actions that can be taken to mitigate, prevent, et cetera. Sure. So we, we mentioned children and pediatrics and neonates. So my understanding from page three here is that the neonatal specialty is the highest average total incurred based on the claim. Why yes. is that? Why are they higher? Is it the emotional aspect of it? It's definitely that, but it's also when you're talking about um, an injury occurring to a newborn, a baby, um, and the need for that support that either whether it be one-on-one nursing care or lifelong support, depending on the injury, that's really driving the cost of of that claim up. And Many folks might or our nurse practitioners might not understand that when a person initiates a liability lawsuit, in addition to the allegations that they might submit with that lawsuit, meaning what failures did they are they outlining that the nurse practitioner did not meet that standard of care in that state by way of their actions or their failure to act, they'll outline that. But on the flip side of that, they'll also outline their demands to be made whole for that claim. Hmm. So it's not just the cost of the injury, but it could be the um, need for for care. Mm -hmm. It could be the, we talked about the emotional aspect, but the parents of that baby or or injured third party can then sue for the loss of happiness of life that 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 the that injury is the resulting injury is um how that's affecting them and their family Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it could be loss of income because the parent now has to stay home with the disabled child so there's there's so many peregrinations of how this all kind of plays out and what i see here is that Physician office practice, aging services facilities, and nurse practitioner office practices are the top three locations where claims occur, and that certain areas are increasing, like aging services claims increased from 17.2 to 20.3% of the total distribution. So we have a lot more elders in elder care facilities, or what you call aging services facilities and we're seeing it's well the cost of everything's gone up in the world right like rents have gone up liabilities going up i mean everything's up right so yes are you are the, what other takeaways do you have from sort of these changes that have happened since your last data set in 2017 what really stands out to you So you talked about rising costs across uh, in our own lives, our personal lives, but that also does happen in healthcare and with liability lawsuits. Um, There's uh, something called social inflation, where it's that the money that are that is being paid out is rising quicker than than what can be explained by just regular inflation rates. Um, It is related to you know, not just those increased costs that we're all experiencing, but it's also that social influence impact. Whereas a few years ago, we might not have heard of a liability lawsuit that happened across the country. And today on our phones, it's delivered up to us in real time to hear about cases and outcomes um, that might not be in our backyard, but that certainly affect not only the profession, but also the jurors that might potentially sit and be judging the um, merits and challenges of a case. Mm. And so that is something that does affect liability lawsuits. 
Um, you mentioned some of the areas, those top areas where we're seeing claims by location and, you know, where when nurse practitioners are working in a physician office or practice, the physician is, you know, included and most likely the co-defendant in those claims. Um, when we talk about areas like the nurse practitioner owned practice, um, where the nurse practitioner is, you know, not only the owner of the practice, so putting on that hat of not just the clinical care, but also now being responsible for hiring practices, or policies and procedures in the practice, staff training and competencies, um, all of those things that come with being a healthcare business owner. Um, so the, the provider is wearing sort of dual hats to you know, not just provide that clinical care to their patients, but also manage the business and operations aspect. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that we're seeing more and more nurse practitioners opening their own practices where we are trying to raise awareness um, is that through our claims data, we can see the increase in frequency of those claims, as well as the increase in the total amount paid on those claims because of whether there might be lacking policies and procedures or the nurse practitioner did not have regular training for their staff. So it's mm -hmm. those failures um, of being that business owner that caused those rising costs and claims in those areas. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there are a lot of cautionary tales out there that you can tell your, your clients, those nurse practitioners who buy their insurance through NSO, CNA, and you can tell them, look, here are where the failures have occurred. These are the holes that we're finding exist in many, let's say, nurse practitioner owned and run practices. So if you're setting up a practice or you already have a practice and you're concerned, here are the holes you can plug in order to decrease your exposure. So, Absolutely. Yeah. If you're going to focus on one area, focus here, here, or here, you know, mm -hmm. with with your um, improvements. Yeah, yes. don't don't spin your wheels here. This is where your exposure is greater. So when yes. we come back from the break, I want to finish up a couple other questions I have for you about the report. And then I want to talk about actions, positive actions, what people can do to protect themselves. So when we come back, we'll talk about that and stay with us for the second half of the episode, number 405 with Jennifer Flynn of Nurses Service Organization. Hey, everyone, let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? Thanks for being a valued listener of The Nurse Keith Show. And if you'd like to help other people find the podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This really helps propel the show and grow our audience. And I truly appreciate everyone who's already taken the time. And if leaving a public rating review isn't your thing, why not tell a colleague about The Nurse Keith Show by sending them a link so they can listen for themselves. After all, word of mouth is the most organic way for me to reach those who truly need to tune in. So if you'd like to do me a solid, please consider leaving a rating review or telling a friend or colleague. And by doing so, you'll be helping the Nurse Keith Show reach more and more nurses and healthcare professionals all around the world. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friend of the pod, Jennifer Flynn. She is the vice president of risk management for nurses service organization in the healthcare division of Aon's Affinity Insurance Services Incorporated. So Jennifer, before the break, we're, we're breaking down what you all have seen in this 2022 claims report as compared to 2017, when you last had a you know full data set, I'm sure you're crunching numbers all the time, but that's that last data set you have to really make these salient comparisons. Now, you've been working in this world of risk management and healthcare insurance for over 20 years. 
So all this time I've been a nurse, which is about going on 27 years, you've been in this other part of the world protecting, helping us protect ourselves and protect us. And like I said, I've been a customer of NSO for a long, long time. So you educate nurses and healthcare professionals on their risk, help them mitigate risk, and you speak on healthcare risk and liability. And you're an author of various um, publications about risk management. So what I see in the report as well is that diagnosis-related claims are their highest percentage of claims. It's 37% of all claims. Yes. So when you say diagnosis related claims, what do you, what do you mean by that? Sure. Um, and thanks again, Keith, for having me today. Um, we're really happy to share the findings of this new claim report for our nurse practitioners and for the healthcare community. I mentioned in part one that NSO uh, partners with our underwriter CNA on bringing insurance, now practice insurance to our nurse practitioners in this space. And CNA is a really great partner in that they are like-minded that we want to inform our nurse practitioners of their daily risks. And so together, we look through all of the claims that come in against nurse practitioners to try and raise awareness of those top areas. Diagnosis as an allegation um, has been the number one allegation against nurse practitioners for uh, the whole time that CNA and NSO have been analyzing claims against nurse practitioners, which is going over 20 years, almost 30 years at this point. And so Knowing that diagnosis is a number one allegation, we tried to take a deep dive into what exactly is driving that area, that top allegation. And it really does boil down to delay in diagnosis and failure in diagnosis mm. that, that make up this analysis and make up this part of the claim study that it is when nurse practitioners fail to order a diagnostic test to establish a diagnosis, when they um, might have a patient who needs uh, escalated or um, specialty care, not making that referral um, to the patient in a timely manner, not doing a complete history and physical to understand um, other factors that might be contributing to the patient's diagnosis, um, and even not following up with the patient in a timely manner. So when you have test results, you know, the nurse practitioner is then reviewing those results, talking with the patient, and making necessary changes or interventions to, again, ensure a positive outcome. And when we're talking about diagnosing cancer, or mm -hmm. sepsis that mm -hmm. might have a, a, a poor outcome because of the morbidity rates of things like that, those are also driving the costs up for some of these diagnosis claims. So when we look at claims, we do look at them in two ways, frequency and severity. How often are they occurring? And when they do occur, what's the financial impact? And diagnosis mm -hmm. hits on both of those areas. Um, which is why it is such a important piece of the of the analysis that we do. Mm -hmm. One of the um, areas where we try to raise awareness with our nurse practitioners is through, you know, knowing and understanding their clinical decision making rationale through the diagnostic approach. So when you have a patient that there, there might be factors that don't align. You know, what additional thoughts or actions are you having with that patient? Are there symptoms that can't be explained with the current diagnosis? Are there symptoms that indicate another diagnosis or that are inconsistent with the current diagnosis? So does it follow and, and, and require a need for further testing for referral or consultation. And it's really the nurse practitioner, their, their clinical 
knowledge, their gut of what are they observing, knowing their patient, what change in condition did they observe that might indicate a different diagnosis or different interventions are, that are needed. And so the report does walk through some of those recommendations to, again, mitigate those risks when, when nurse practitioners are trying to establish a diagnosis. Hmm. Right. So, of course, nurse practitioners are taught many of these skills in school, of course. And what I hear from a lot of people becoming FNP specifically, family nurse practitioners, is that many feel as if they're being, they're kind of like a square peg being pounded into the round hole of being like a doctor and doing these 15 minute visits. And they often say to me, or they say on social media, when I'm reading things people write and post about, it's like, how can I practice the way I was taught in NP school when they want me to see a patient in 15 minutes? And this is where corners get cut. This is where stress levels rise. This is where burnout comes in. And this is where people start to speed up because they're being pushed to speed up because the insurance companies only want these 15 minute visits. And then the practice of course is pushing these 15 minute visits or even 20 minutes. It's just not enough time. So when it comes to mitigating self-protection, trying to not have a claim <laughs> or even a board of nursing complaint that doesn't lead to an actual claim of injury. And it's just a complaint made against you to the board of nursing in your state. What are some of the things like your main recommendations, like you alluded to that nurse practitioners should probably take into consideration and maybe operationalize? Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you really hit it on the head that we are also like-minded in trying to have nurse practitioners follow consistent practices to have those consistent positive patient outcomes. And we wouldn't be talking about these claims if we're not talking about the claims where everything goes right and, and everything goes well during that treatment and care management. It's it is the nurse practitioner to know and understand and make reasonable interventions with their patients. Uh, I am sure any nurse practitioner or even any nurse will tell you they know the patients either by way of their clinical diagnosis who need additional treatment and care or handholding or by way of their personality and, and, and how they interpret the information that you're that you're providing to them may need additional um, information, and so me medical malpractice lawsuits. Um, that standard of care is really very simply put, and I'm going to make it a simple definition: is what would a reasonably prudent person have done in a similar situation? So when you have a, a patient who, um, like I said, might clinically be more of a mystery that you are paying more attention to that patient, that, that if you're saying, I do X, Y, and Z with every patient, that you are actually doing that with your patients. And that, that might be looking in the record um, before seeing that patient, knowing that history of the patient, knowing what their chief complaint is that day and how they are presenting. Every patient and every case, it comes with its unique set of circumstances and facts. And we know that our nurse practitioners are working diligently to manage the time constraints that they have, the burden of, you know, the operational constraints that are put on them and, and making money for their practice but they're, the patient safety goal for us is to help nurse practitioners understand mm -hmm. reasonably what they could do with each and every patient and follow those consistent practices. Right. Those are actions and practices. And 
you have something here on page 24, which every nurse knows and every nurse practitioner knows is the importance of documentation. And what I was thinking about a moment ago was I remember learning algebra and learning mathematics in school, right? The, the, the professor, a teacher would always be show your work. So I know what your thought process was. So what I've always taken away as a nurse is the same thing is show your work. Don't just write the conclusion you came to write your thought process. You know, what did you assess? What did the patient say? You can actually write down subjective data. Patient said, quote, Mark. Absolutely. So you have exact quotes from the patient, which the patient could deny they are having said, but still you write it down. So the importance of documentation, you have to reflect what actually happened, but also what was going on in your head, right? Yes. So what are other actions that either a nurse or a nurse practitioner should bear in mind in terms of mitigating risk and protecting themselves and protecting this license that they've spent so much money and time and blood, sweat, and tears to earn. Right. So um, documentation is a key factor in any malpractice lawsuit. And you had mentioned the importance of documentation. And we see that especially with malpractice lawsuits. So it's not just your clinical observations and your your diagnosis and what you prescribe to the patient, but it is factually documenting then, you know, what you heard, what you saw, what the patient stated, what you might have given them in terms of follow-up or educational materials and how the patient responded to that. Many providers don't realize that the record is, the healthcare record is a legal document and it can provide and uh, evidence of what was done during that treatment and care visit um, to provide against misunderstandings, to provide a clear picture of, you know, what the patient's status was, you know, during and after that visit. It can even provide evidence of non-adherence on the patient's part if Mm -hmm. you have provided instructions to follow up within certain days or go for a test and they and they had not. So all of that, along with the clinical decision making rationale is something that should be found in the record for purposes of um, building a defense in case of a liability lawsuit. With the mm-hmm. age of electronic health records, especially, uh, many providers might not realize, but the everything they do in the record is now time stamped. So what terminal they used, what keystrokes they made, additions, deletions, what pages they viewed, what tests were available while they viewed that record, and then what in, and any interventions they made, that it's all in the record. And plaintiff's attorneys have become very savvy to request this documentation, the data behind the data to sort of build that timeline of what was going on at the time of the incident. Mm. So, um, you know, we, we talk about a few key items where nurse practitioners should focus. You know, one is starting with what they can or cannot do in their state. So their, their practice act following and meeting that scope of, of, and that standard of care in their state. Because diagnosis and prescribing are key allegations, we then, you know, ask them to invest in keeping abreast of changes or knowing uh, about um, interactions between medications and what they're prescribing for their patients. Um, It's not just those contraindicated medications that we're seeing as drivers, but it's also almost like the having that informed consent discussion with your patient, but related to the medications. You're Mm -hmm. informing them why you prescribe that medication, what risks or benefits it has for that patient. Um, Were there any alternatives to that one medication that could be 
could have been prescribed and why you've chosen not to, what the patient should do and know and, and know about any outcomes of that, that medication where they should seek or escalate care. Um, and then, you know, what to do if they have any questions and allow that patient to ask questions. So it's managing expectations. It is, you know, keeping abreast and keeping your core competencies. It's having really good written and spoken skills with your patients. You know, when you're talking about managing expectations, a lot of that is having hard and difficult conversations if the patient isn't heeding your advice or isn't following the regimen and not um, not reluctantly giving in to patient demands if it goes against your clinical knowledge of how that patient um, might respond should they have a downturn in their their status. Mm -hmm. And so these recommendations may seem like no brainers, but these are the core recommendations that we see that aren't consistently followed in each of these liability lawsuits. Nurse practitioners saying, well, I typically would do this, but this didn't happen for this patient and here's why. And, and it is based on time constraints and complex patients, um, but it's reasonably what would be, have been expected of you and making sure that that's in the record by way of your documentation. Right. And when a nurse practitioner has their own practice, like we said earlier, they're wearing many hats. And one of those hats is making sure your support staff are trained and that they're documenting correctly too, because you could be documenting everything correctly, but maybe you haven't made sure your medical assistants or nurses aides or your RNs or LPNs are doing what you want done in order to protect your practice, this practice that you're, you know, you're banking your future on if it's your independent or group practice. So there's, it's, you know, you can work for another organization, of course. You can have an employer. You can work for yourself. You can work within a group. You can work for a nonprofit or a for profit, any kind of organization. And I've asked this question of several other guests over the years, but I want to ask you, and I know what you're going to say, but I just want to say it out loud. For RNs and NPs who have employers, like say they work for X hospital, for instance, or X, Y physician practice. Sure. I've heard nurses tell me, oh, I don't have my own liability insurance because I'm covered under my employer. And my response is always 100% ironclad response is if the feces hits the fan legally, so to speak, <laughs> who do you think your employer is going to throw under the bus first? So do you really believe that they're going to protect you and give their lawyers the, if they're going to instruct their lawyers to do everything they can to protect you or to protect them? Do you agree with that? So I obviously have a biased opinion because I work for NSO, because I see the claims where the state board of nursing matters that come through through the program. You know, we always say that your employer should be providing that coverage for you. And um, for many nurses, they feel that is adequate coverage. Mm -hmm. I always look to when we survey our nurses or we talk with our nurses at conferences or we lean on the 80 plus national state and specialty nursing associations that endorse the NSO program and partner with us to keep abreast and understand trends of the industry. When we survey those groups and we say, why did you get your own liability insurance? There's a few reasons they point to that have been consistent over the years. One is peace of mind, mm -hmm. just peace of mind, knowing that they are covered, whether they change jobs, do independent contracting, um, volunteer, mm -hmm. you know, the peace of mind of knowing that they can be a nurse wherever and whenever and are covered. Mm -hmm. um, but secondary to that is that they 
might want to have additional coverages that they their employer doesn't provide. And one of those being defense uh, reimbursement for state board of nursing complaints. Uh, most employers who might be obligated to make the complaint in the first place to the state board of nursing are then not going to turn around and provide coverage for that or defense for that. No. And so if you think about the state board of nursing and the authority that they have to enact sanctions, whether that be a fine or continuing education, which are, um, I would say, less severe outcomes, but all the way up to and including license suspension or mm -hmm. revocation, mm -hmm. which are very severe and affect the livelihood of you practicing as a nurse, you want to have a defense for that when you are defending your license against those state board of nursing complaints. And so many times we hear from our nurses that they do it for peace of mind to be a nurse wherever and whenever, and to also have those coverages that are going to protect them, whether they have a malpractice lawsuit or a state board of nursing mm. complaint. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, vindicating my opinion. Um, you know, if it's a few hundred dollars or even whatever it is per year, I think it's so worth it when, like I said, you've worked so hard to get what you have. And if you've spent years earning the degrees and the license and the, the specialty certifications you have, you don't want to blow it by not being fully protected. So I'm I'm totally on board and I'm glad to hear that from you. So Jennifer, there's so much more we could talk about, but we are running the clock down. And I have four quick lightning round questions I ask all my guests towards the end, which okay. doesn't really have anything to do with what we've been talking about. Are you game? Sure. Okay. So the first question is, how do you define success either personally or professionally? Well, success to me is um, multifaceted. It is personally being fulfilled, you know, so personal fulfillment. It's knowing that I'm providing for my family. So I think the probably the third component of success for me is feeling enjoyment that the work that you're doing is important and that you can positively affect the groups that you are there to support. And so for me, that that is success. Great. Thank you. Okay. The second question is, could you name or even just describe a person who's inspired you in the course of your life? It can be a living or dead person, a very famous person, or maybe just someone in your own family. Sure. You know, I, I really feel like I'm inspired every day with, with the folks that I work with at NSO and CNA. I, I'm surrounded by those who are nurses and nurse practitioners or have clinical experience, those who help me um, from a leadership standpoint and that you can go to any time with an issue and, and get some advice. I'm inspired by my parents who taught me and, and every day instill, you know, those values that I really strive and, and to go out and even impart to my own children. Mm -hmm. But I, I am in, really inspired by not just working hard, being ethical, but those, those folks that take all of that and really practice it in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. So you've been inspired by family members, but also the people who you work with at your current job. That's nice. I think it's great to be inspired from both sides. Now, the third question, the penultimate question is, is there a book or a movie? It doesn't have to be your absolute number one favorite that's had an impact on the way you think or the way you live your life. Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Um, let's see, a book or a movie? Mm -hmm. 
I do read a lot, but it's <laughs> it's probably those uh, murder mysteries <laughs> that mm-hmm. I am most drawn to. So they're not <laughs> quite as inspiring, um, oh, but but. Um, I think my mind is really drawn to figuring out puzzles or pieces. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So, you know, when I when we talk about books or movies, I love um, probably seeing themes like that Mm -hmm. in in what I'm either reading or watching. And that actually makes a lot of sense in relation to the work you do, because you know, when there's a claim against a nurse practitioner or a nurse, or there's, um, you know, there's some situation that has these, you know, great legal, you know, implications, you know, jurisprudence that this there, it is a puzzle. It is a mystery and you have to help put it all together to help protect this person or, you know, help have a good outcome. So I, I appreciate that. I think there's, there is a connection between those two. Yeah. Yeah. So the final question is, what's a piece of advice that you would give 18-year-old Jennifer right now, whether you think she would listen or not? What would you tell her right now based on what you know in your life? Oh, boy. You know, it's funny that you asking are asking me this question. Um, I have a soon-to-be 18-year-old. Oh, I see. And... In talking with my daughter just the other day, we were talking about some challenges that she was facing with her friend group and um, that she is getting ready to graduate high school. And and we talked about sort of the, the, the great thing about reinventing yourself in different chapters of your life as you mm-hmm. embark on a new chapter that you can keep and build on those things that you really like to do and really inspire you, but also it provides you the opportunity to change or pivot on those things that we, I mean, we all have things that we would want to work on and want to improve on, but Mm -hmm. these new chapters and changes in your life give you the opportunity to make those improvements and change yourself. And so I would say that for me, my eight to my 18 year old self and, and would be to never stop changing, never Mm -hmm. stop growing. Um, Mm -hmm. because that truly is what life is about to find out what you love and what you're passionate about. And, and to also, you know, be a good steward on this earth and, and I'm also a psychology major, so I'm very interested in Mm -hmm. personal behaviors and outcomes. And so, you know, not doing the same thing the same way every time, but changing your own self to to Mm -hmm. to sort of test the waters of what could be um, if you just put yourself out there and and give yourself sort of a a break if things don't always turn out the way you want to, because you have the ability of what's in your control, and that's to change the way you do things to have a a different outcome. Well said. Thank you. That was great. And I hope hope your current 18-year-old will listen. (laughs) I hope so, too. (laughs) Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. Thanks for coming to us and bringing this report from Nurses Service Organization to us. And I really appreciate you imparting all this really important information. And maybe there's one or two nurses out there who will change something they do to help protect themselves and their patients more. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Keith. I really appreciate it. I had a great time today speaking with you and um, look forward to maybe even a future session. (laughs) That's right. Talking about RNs next time. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show. The show notes will be at nursekeith.com or in any podcast app where you happen to be listening. If you need personalized holistic career coaching, look no further than nursekeith.com. Mention the show and get 10% off your first coaching package. And remember to head over to rnegade.pro, R-N-E-G-A-D-E.pro, where you can actually earn CE credits by listening to podcasts and taking a little post 
post test. Look for Nurse Keith in the content creator dropdown or all the other awesome content creators as well. We are a proud member of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our social media ringmaster. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by Steve Jobs. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way we do great work is to love what we do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know it when you find it. So be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico and Jennifer Flynn of Nurses Service Organization saying arrivederci from Warrington, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you on the proverbial flip side. Thank you.